I'm Professor Peter Budd. I'm a professor of polymer chemistry at the University of Manchester. I'm chairing today's meeting and I'm delighted to welcome today Rhoda Hawkins to talk about order and disorder. Hello, Rhoda. So Rhoda, she did her PhD um, in Oxford. Uh, sorry, she did her under first degree in Oxford, her PhD in Leeds. She's worked in various places um, uh, in, in the Netherlands, in France. Uh, she's a visiting lecturer at the African Institute of uh, Mathematical Sciences, which means that she's lectured in, I think, uh, South Africa and Senegal and Ghana. And she's currently a senior lecturer in Sheffield. And her research is uh, in theoretical physics, but at the interface with biological sciences. And order and disorder, of course, are themes which crop up in science and also crop up in theology. So we're going to learn, I hope, a lot more today about that uh, interaction, both between science and faith, and also about the different ways in which order and disorder can be understood. So without any more ado, I'll hand over to Rhoda. Thank you, Peter. Well, it's a, a pleasure to be with you in Manchester. Um, so I'm going to talk about order and disorder. Now, um, some of you might possibly have heard me talking about this topic before. Um, so sorry if I'm repeating myself, um, but I'm hoping that for everybody, there will be some new things also um, that I'm going to present today. And um, I'm looking forward to having some questions and discussion with you um, later on um, in today's session. So let me um, tell you what I'm planning on doing in, in this talk. Um, I'm going to um, introduce um, what I mean by order and disorder. And then I'm going to do a whistle stop tour through various different topics in science where order and disorder appear um, with um, some preference for some areas coming from my own area of, of research. And then I'm going to talk about some connections that I see with Christian theology. Um, and um, I'm then looking forward to having some discussion with you at the end. So um, what do I mean by disorder? So we often talk about disorder. We talk about randomness. We talk about chance. And sometimes it can get confusing because there are different definitions depending on whether we're talking about something technical in science, or we're talking in terms of everyday language. So there are different meanings of, of the word random. In everyday life, sometimes we mean purposelessness. Something happens by chance, it happens at random. Now that's quite different from what we mean by randomness in, 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 a, in a technical scientific sense. So what I'm talking about when I talk about randomness is that the microscopic details of a system are, that, is, that is random are unpredictable. In some systems, they're unpredictable in practice, and in some systems, they're even unpredictable in theory. Um, but even if the microscopic details are unpredictable, the macroscopic processes might be very predictable. And so I'm going to show you some examples of how this works um, in science. And um, so th that's just a, an overview of, of what I'm meaning, just to distinguish um, what I'm talking about in science with what we sometimes think of in everyday life as the meaning of random or um, disorder. So uh, this is tightly connected with um, thermodynamics and in particular with the second law of thermodynamics, which is something that um, is of crucial importance to science, particularly physics and chemistry, but by extension, also biology. Um, and the second law of thermodynamics is about entropy, which can be described as a measure of disorder. And so the second law of thermodynamics says that entropy always increases in, in an isolated system. And so, and, and that includes in the universe as a, as a whole. So if entropy is always increasing, this suggests, this, this is basically saying that the disorder in the universe is always increasing. So in other words, things go from an order system to a disordered system. So 
gradually we lose order and have more disorder. A little bit like an ordered pack of cards then gets muddled up. Now, obviously, this is um, not always locally the case. Um, there are many examples of emergent order locally. Um, but um, if we take an isolated system or the whole universe, then the second law of thermodynamics says that the, uh, um, the, the disorder, the total disorder is actually increasing. And um, this is connected to uh, what is sometimes called the arrow of time. Things go forwards, not backwards. Um, and so once we have um, lost that um, order, then uh, we, uh, we can't get it back again unless we expend a large amount of energy uh, to, uh, to, to go back again. Um, and um, we can't go backwards in time. So um, one example, a very dramatic example of order and disorder in, in science, that is something that we're all very familiar of, familiar with, is phase transitions. So this is just water, which is um, a very important substance because um, it's uh, essential for all of life as we know it. Um, so water can exist in solid as ice, in a liquid, as, um, as the water we, we drink, for example, or as a gas, um, as steam. And as we increase the temperature, we know that we can change phase um, from solid to liquid to gas. And the other thing that's happening in, in, this, um, in these phase transitions is we go from a more ordered structure in the solid crystal to a more disordered um, um, arrangement of the molecules in the liquid and then even more disordered in, in the gas. Um, now, I've, um, I've come from a background of, of um, soft matter physics and um, one of the beautiful areas of soft matter physics is liquid crystals, whereby um, liquid crystals are a, also a, a phase of matter, but they're somewhere in between um, solid, um, solids and liquids. So um, on the left hand side of the screen, we see a, um, a little cartoon I've drawn of a crystalline solid where everything is beautifully ordered and um, the positions of the atoms are ordered. But a liquid crystal has molecules that are rod shaped rather than point like. And so there's another degree of freedom um, in this system, which is the direction of the molecules. So in a crystalline solid uh, um, made of a liquid crystal, then all of the directions of the rod like um, molecules, rod like particles are all pointing the same way. And in an isotropic liquid crystal, which is like the liquid phase, um, the positions of the molecules and their directions are random. We call this isotropic because if you look in each direction, it looks the same. Isotropic means each direction is the same. But in between these two extremes, there's um, something that we call a pneumatic li liquid crystal, whereby the directions of the molecules are ordered so in this sense, they're, they're all up down, they, or in this orientational order. Um, but the positions are disordered. So the positions are in, are in random places. So in some senses, it's ordered like a solid, but in some senses, it's disordered like a liquid. And that's why we call it a liquid crystal, because there's elements of order, um, which is like a crystal, but there's elements of liquid disorder phase as well. Um, and... Um, Within um, liquid crystals, we get interesting um, sp um, spontaneous symmetry breaking, um, whereby um, if we go from the uh, liquid crystal, um, the isotropic liquid crystal phase, and we go to the pneumatic liquid crystal phase, then a direction is chosen. And that direction could be chosen at random, um, which is spontaneous symmetry breaking of, of choosing a direction at random, or we could uh, give it a direction um, by imposing an external field. For example, um, we could um, impose a, 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 an electric field, and that is what's happening in your devices as you're watching this, um, because your device is probably a liquid crystal display, and that's exactly what's happening um, there. Um, so I'm my research area is in biological physics, so I'm interested in... Um, the emergence of order from disorder in biological systems. And this is an, a nice example that I worked on many years ago um, when I did my first postdoc in Amsterdam. And um, what you, the green fuzzy thing you see on the screen is, um, is a plant cell. And um, inside the plant cell, there are um, proteins called microtubules, which are 
um, long and thin, um, rod-like, um, a bit like the pneumatic liquid crystal that we saw in the, in the cartoons on the previous slide. Um, but initially, um, the directions are pointing all over the place um, and um, it's, a, it's a disordered system. But as I play the video, um, you will see that um, a, some order emerges um, and eventually um, we get stripes appearing um, whereby the um, long and thin um, protein filaments are all pointing in um, the same way and we start seeing these, um, these stripy patterns. And um, that's um, important in plant cells because um, these particular proteins actually um, direct the cellulose fibers that make up the, um, the, the, the um, plant cell wall. Um, and so they determine which direction the plant cell wall is laid down in and, um, and eventually that, that is built up to give the strength of, of the plants. Um, so um, I, 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 I'm interested in how systems like this self-assemble assemble and produce order when they start in, in a disordered um, state. So it's a little bit like a phase transition in, um, um, in, in a material, but there's extra things going on in the biological situation um, because um, it's consuming energy um, and from um, it's, it's consuming energy internal to the cell, not just um, what, what energy we put in externally if we're boiling a kettle, for example. Um, so, um, the way that physicists describe um, systems that, that, that have many particles in them is using a branch of, um, uh, of physics called statistical mechanics. Um, and using uh, calculations with statistical mechanics, we can, we can predict what's going to happen on a large scale, even when there is disorder on a small length scale. Um, so, a typical example of this is um, the fact that we can calculate the temperature of a room, even though we don't know the, the exact positions or velocities of all the air particles in the room. Um, so physicists are, um, some people think they're clever, but actually as physicists, we're pretty simple minded. Uh, we have to be simple minded, otherwise we can't do the maths. Um, and so the way that physicists count is we can count one, two, and then we go straight to infinity because anything in between is too hard. So statistical mechanics deals with the infinity bit. If we have many, many particles, we can average over many particles and we can make predictions about what's happening on a larger scale um, uh, um, when we average over things that are happening um, randomly on a smaller scale. Um, so this is a very powerful, um, area of uh, physics and um, it's being used, it's used in lots of different um, areas of physics, including in areas of, of biophysics. Um, but some of the um, equilibrium traditional areas of um, statistical mechanics have to be adapted to be able to cope with um, biological um, systems that have got, that are out of equilibrium. That means they're consuming energy. Um, and um, so, um, something that's really important in biological systems is, um, is what we call Brownian motion, um, named after Robert Brown, who first observed what he described as dancing um, pollen grains down his microscope. Um, and um, this is the, the random thermal motion that we now call um, Brownian motion. Um, and um, that's important in biology because uh, everything in biology is warm. Um, I mean warm in in the sense that um, it's it, um, it's the the, um, the the thermal energy associated with the temperatures that that life exists at either room temperature or for mammals blood temperature um, the thermal energy associated with those temperatures is similar to the energy scales that are um, important for life processes. So what that means is that um, temperature uh, and the thermal energy associated with temperature is really important for biological systems. Um, so um, what I'd like to describe to you now is um, something um, is, is what we call stochastic processes. Stochastic means random, um, but um, the example I've drawn for you on this slide is of a filament 
like the ones I was showing you before that were labeled in green in the experimental image. Um, and these can polymerize or depolymerize. So the filaments can grow longer or get shorter. Um, but to grow longer, they consume energy um, in doing this. They consume energy in the form of biochemical energy. Um, and indirectly, this energy comes um, from the food that um, the organism is, um, is eating, or if it's a plant, from photosynthesis um, from, from the sunlight. Um, now, um, the thing about stochastic processes like this one is that, um, like with um, other things in statistical mechanics, we can quite accurately predict what's going to happen on a um, longer time scale, but on a short time scale, we don't know exactly when the events are going to occur. So because um, the event of a new subunit adding on to a filament like this is a random stochastic event, um, it, it will happen at some point, but we cannot know exactly at what time point it will happen because that is dependent on all of the um, motions of all the molecules around it and their collisions and a little bit like the little video I showed you on this slide where everything's moving around randomly and there's collisions and everything happening. Um, and, and it becomes um, impossible for us to calculate the exact moment at which um, a subunit will add on the end. Um, so that's, we, that, that we take as random. However, we, um, we can calculate what, um, the rate at which it will happen on average. And so then if we look at a system like this on longer timescales, we can um, quite accurately predict how fast something like this will grow um, based on averages of when a, a single subunit will add on. Um, so these events are what we call rare events. That means they're rare compared to how often a water molecule is going to hit another water molecule in a liquid, for example. Um, but they're not so rare that we, um, that we can look at a time scale longer than them. Um, so I'm going to show you now a, um, a simulation that a PhD student of mine called James Bradford wrote um, studying um, polymerization of one of these filaments. Um, it's actually a filament called actin, it's another protein. Um, and um, what, what I'm gonna show you here is um, initially there's no molecules. Um, and then molecules, uh, these filaments start nu what we call nucleating. That means a, a, a small number of subunits come together to, to um, make what we call a seed, and then it starts growing fast from there. Um, and um, what's going to happen eventually is that the molecules are going to hit this um, red line, and they're going to push the red line upwards. So um, that's what you're looking out for. And um, there's also going to be some, um, uh, some branching happening um, in this simulation. Um, and that's caused by a, another protein um, that um, uh, nucleates uh, filaments off an, off an existing one. So now you see that this process of growing these filaments longer is actually pushing this line upwards. Um, now, what you don't uh, um, directly see in this video is that we've got a little force acting downwards on, on, the, um, on the line. So, so these, um, these filaments that are growing have to... Um, push against that force and overcome that force to be able to push the line upwards. Um, so there's there's lots happening in the simulation, um, but each growing point of um, one of these filaments is happening randomly. So we're, it's like we're throwing a dice in the, in, the, in the computer to set up the simulation to work out um, what's happening um, uh, at each, uh, to, to, to calculate the probability, and we calculate the probabilities of, of the events happening. Um, and so each time you run a simulation like, like this, it's going to be slightly different. Um, uh, and, um, but the overall effect of, in this case, the, um, the network pushing the line upwards is, is going to be the same. Um, and so that was um, an example of something that, um, that I, uh, I'm working on with a, with a PhD student of mine. Um, and my next slide is, is, is going to a different area of, of physics that um, I don't actually work on. Well, I do, at the, yes, anyway. The butterfly effect I don't work on, um, but um, you've probably heard of the butterfly effect as a, as a way of describing chaos. So 
um, the thing about chaos is that um, small fluctuations get amplified. Um, and the reason they get amplified is because of the non-linearities non in, um, in the equations. Um, so even if you've got um, deterministic equations, which means they're not to do with probabilities, they're, they're actually uh, accurately calculating um, what's happening. So a deterministic equation is, is not one based on probabilities, it's, it's based on, on actual uh, knowledge of the, of the forces and, and causes of things. Um, if those equations are nonlinear, a very small difference in the initial conditions can cause a very large difference um, in results. So whereas I was talking before about probabilities of um, an event happening, um, you can also get a system that becomes unpredictable because um, even if we can write down exactly the causes of what's happening, any slight difference in the starting conditions is going to cause such a large difference to the result that we can't predict it. And this is what's happening um, in um, systems, in turbulent systems, in systems that display chaos. Um, and um, a, typ a typical example that's often used is, is, is forecasting the weather, um, which as we know is, is, is very difficult to do. Um, but at the bottom here, I'm, I'm actually showing some of my um, own um, images from one of my papers, um, which is actually um, showing um, this turbulence effect, but um, the turbulence is due to a completely different um, physical phenomenon than what you what you see in, in, in the weather for, forecasting systems, for example. So in this system, the, um, uh, the dynamics of the fluid are not turbulent, so you don't have turbulent air or water, um, but um, um, even though the, the flows are smooth, um, because you've got a continual injection of energy that we call active, in this case, it's biochemical energy in a cell, um, then you, you, get, um, you get systems that look turbulent. Um, they, they, they look similar to the turbulent effects that you get in water or air but the dynamics underlying them are actually quite different. Um, so um, th this is just a, an, an example of the fact that um, we can see um, effects that look random um, and um, are difficult to predict um, uh, in different systems. But what I've talked about so far are things that in principle we could calculate, it's just we don't know accurately enough all the details and that small fluctuations get amplified. Um, but if we go to the realm of quantum mechanics, so we're going smaller now, we're going in, inside an atom in terms of length scales, um, then we get to a point where um, actually everything is probab probabilistic um, in the sense that um, it, it, we just, we, we, we don't actually, uh, uh, we don't, we can't know the outcome. So a typical example of, of a quantum mechanics um, problem like this is if we have a, a classic double slit experiments and uh, uh, Young's double slits. So we've got a source of um, electrons, for example, going through two slits and um, we're going to detect them with a detector um, at the other side. Now, if we put the electrons through one by one, um, the electron will go through one of the, one of the slits and will end up um, on the detector. And if we think about that as a particle, then um, it makes sense that the electron went through one of the slits. But if we think about it in terms of a wave, if you imagine these were water waves, well, the, the wave front would actually go through both slits and we'd get an interference pattern um, and on, on the detector. Now, what actually happens um, when we do a quantum mechanics um, experiment like this is that we, we see that interference pattern. Um, and this is um, this is described in terms of wave particle duality and um, that an electron we think of as a particle, but it can actually also act as a wave. Um, and um, and so there's there's a probability of the electron going through each each slit. But um, to make sense of the interference pattern, it means that actually they um, that it went through both slits. Um, but if you try and um, uh, be clever about this and, and measure at the level of the slit which slit the electron went through. That actually changes the result of what you see on the detector. So um, that's uh, it's, uh, it's, it's called a measurement problem. 
of the fact that the measurement actually changes the outcome. So I, I'm, I'm using, I'm talking about quantum mechanics here as, as another example of something that's random, but something that's random in a slightly different way from the stochastic process I was all talking about before, um, in the sense that with, with quantum mechanics, it's indeterminate, um, whereas some of these other systems are determinate systems, but um, it's just they're so sensitive to, to the details that we in practice can't calculate the, the details. Um, this, um, I, I said I was going to do a whistle stop tour through lots of different areas of physics, so I thought I'd have one slide on astrophysics. Um, I, um, I work in a, in a department called physics and, 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 and astronomy, so I have some, uh, some colleagues who, who work in, um, in astrophysics. Um, and um, there's, what interests me when I see some images like, like these ones of, um, of um, astrophysics structures is that we often see um, a large scale apparent disorder but then we see emergence at smaller scales, which is the opposite from um, what I tend to see um, in my work, whereby things are happening, um, things are um, disordered at a small scale and, and order emerges on a larger scale. Um, but let me uh, quickly go back to the area I'm a bit more comfortable in, um, which is in terms of biological physics. And um, the, the, the thing that makes biological systems, living systems different from the sorts of um, passive systems that um, that we tend the traditional physics has has studied is that um, life is what we call um, out of equilibrium in the sense that it is consuming energy all the time and it needs to do that in order to maintain order now order is extremely important in life um, and most um, most most people are aware of DNA being the um, being a genetic code, and it's really important that um, the DNA or the order of the DNA is preserved in order to um, in or, in order to to um, uh, preserve life. And life maintains this order at an incredible accuracy. So the mutation, the natural muta the spontaneous muta mutation rate in DNA is only one in a hundred million per generation. Um, and so life um, is able to maintain this order despite the second law of thermodynamics, meaning things over um, the total um, outcome of processes is an increase in disorder. So how, how does life do it? Well, it does it by, um, by an intake of energy, um, food, or, um, photo, or or light in photosynthesis, um, so it needs that that intake of energy in order to maintain the order um, and and obey the, the, the second law of thermodynamics. So this um, this is a little picture of me running, um, and uh, in, I love running, but in order to run, I need to eat bananas. So uh, that's just a little example of. Uh, of the way I maintain my own life by eating, um, as we all do. Um, but by talking about life needing to maintain order like that, it implies that disorder is a bad thing. But actually, there's a very positive role of, for disorder in biology. Um, during my PhD, I, I worked on vibrations in single molecule proteins. Um, and, um, and there are many um, proteins that have intrinsically disordered regions in them. Um, uh, within the, the molecules and these regions are um, um, are, are vibrating um, and they and, and, and changing their, their 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 structure and they don't have a um, an ordered structure although most proteins um, do have a, a, a structured an ordered structure um, but it turns out that um, intrinsically disordered regions of proteins are actually important in their interactions with other um, molecules. Um, and on the um, right hand side of the screen, um, I've shown um, a, net a branch network of the, of the kinds of filaments I was showing earlier. Um, and um, the reason I'm showing that here is that um, in some senses, this network is disordered in the sense that it's branched and it's pointing in all different directions, which is very different from the same molecules in a muscle where um, all of the filaments line up in a very ordered structure in a muscle. But um, it turns out that an, an actin network of the kind that you see on this slide, where it's all pointing in different disordered directions, is able to contract 
um, e even though the filaments are pointing in all kinds of directions. Um, the contraction is smaller than the contraction in, in our muscles, which is, um, which is ordered, but there's still a contraction there. And it, that contraction is absolutely essential when um, it comes to cells moving, including immune cells that I'll talk about briefly later. So disorder creates and destroys life. So mutations, I said, I said it's amazing how, how mutations are, um, are so few and that the DNA, the order of the DNA is maintained so well. But without mutations, we wouldn't have the evolution of life. So mutations are necessary for life to evolve. But as we know, mutations can sometimes be bad mutations and can lead to um, diseases such as cancer. Um, and I find this fascinating. So this is, this is um, the, both the positive and negative roles of having a bit of disorder creeping into your ordered structure of DNA. So John Polkinghorne um, has a nice way of describing this. And he says that the creative order looks like a package deal. You can't have one without the other. You can't have a complex life evolving without having um, um, genetic diseases um, occurring, um, such as cancer. Um, so this leads me on to, to thinking a little bit more about the philosophical and theological implications of um, order and disorder. Now, we see in the Bible, order and disorder appears right at the beginning. So in Genesis 1, the first chapter of the Bible, it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep and the spirit of God was hovering over the waters. So that describes a disordered system. And then, as you will well know, the rest of that chapter goes on to describe how God brought order out of that disorder in creating um, the world, creating the universe. Um, and... Um, um, there's a there's a there's an um there's also aspects of uh creation stories in job um and this particular quote from from job 38 is talking about um god fixing the limits for the sea um this far you may come and no further um and which which is suggesting um bringing order out of disorder in terms of putting limits on things um, and, and Tom McLeish described this as um, cha cha chaotic energy is not denied, but channeled. So there, there is um, much disorder in the creative, created universe, but that that um, disorder is channeled and ordered in some way, but it's still there. So there, this order is as much part of creation as order, but it's this interesting interplay between disorder and order that's important to, to, to life. Um, and uh, the, the final quote on this slide is a quote from Alistair McGrath. For, for physicists, chaos is the womb of order, which is a beautiful poetic way of, of saying, basically physicists um, love chaos and disorder because we're interested in how does order emerge from that. Um, and, um, and I think that's a, a nice way of, of putting it, that um, without the disorder that we see in, um, in, in systems, we wouldn't have the emergence of, of, of the order that we see. So both are important. Um, so I, I, I'd like to make a few words, a few comments about um, what, what does God know? So we've talked about um, what we can work out as scientists um, and situations where we can't know, um, like in, in quantum mechanics, um, and all we can do is predict probabilities um, uh, that, um, uh, in terms of the outcome of an indeterminate event. But we've also talked about chaotic or stochastic events whereby, in principle, we could work it out. It's just that um, we would need to know the the initial conditions so accurately that in practice we we can't and so again we um we uh, we use probabilities to to describe um systems so what about god um because we we're, we're finite in terms of what we can know and what we can't know but what about god does god know in advance the outcome of indeterminates 
events, stochastic events, chaotic events? Um, now, this is a, an open question, um, I think, in, in theology, and different people will have different views on this. But um, one, one view that I find particularly interesting is, um, is the idea of open theism. And, and this is described by Arthur Peacock as God is omniscient with only a probabilistic knowledge of the outcome of some events. God is om omnipotent, but self-limited by God's nature as love. So this is commenting on, uh, can God know the outcome of our quantum mechanical experiment before the experiment is done? Um, suggesting, well, no, it, he, like we only has a probabilistic knowledge of this. Um, and then relating that to um, the theological concept of um, God being all powerful, but choosing to limit that power in order to give um, love to human beings, including free will and things like that. Um, John Polkinghorne also comments on, on um, open theism. Um, so he says, um, if the future is truly open, even God does not yet know the unformed future. So this is actually a discussion in theology, as um, even if you don't relate it to science, in terms of um, what, what does God know? Uh, does God know all of the future? Does God know um, the results of decisions that we haven't yet made? Do we have real free will or um, is it all predetermined? So this is a this is a um, this has been a, a long going discussion in, in theology. And, and I think that it's got it's got some interesting parallels in, in modern physics um, in terms of um, what what we can predict and, um, and know and what we can't know. Um, so John Polkinghorne's view is that there is a general overview, overall purpose being fulfilled in what's going on, but the details of what actually happens are left to the contingencies of history, this happening rather than that. The picture is of a world endowed with fruitfulness, guided by its creator, but allowed an ability to realise its fruitfulness in its own particular ways. Chance is a sign, a sign of freedom, not blind purposelessness, um, which is... is is um, giving um, a chance, a very positive um, spin in, in that picture. But this begs questions of causation. Um, now, often in science, we, we have a methodological reductionism in our approaches that we, um, and I've see, I see this a lot in, in modern biology, that people study biological systems by trying to work out all of the constituents' molecules. And once they've worked out all the molecules that are involved, then great, they're done. Except someone like me comes along and says, well, that doesn't explain anything. How do these things come together? Uh, what's happening what, What's happening at a physical level? Um, and so reductionism in terms of science can be very helpful, but it doesn't actually explain everything. Sometimes um, we need to balance that with emergence and what happens when we put all these different things together. So what is it about water that makes it wet? We can't study the wetness of water if we're only looking at a single molecule of water. And the same is, is, is true in, in biological systems. So um, increasingly, scientists are recognising that bottom-up and top-down causation is, is actually important, um, especially in biological systems um, and, and more complex biological or organisms. Um, so... Um, um, this, this, um, this, this is to—I mean, this is to do with uh, information and energy transfers from bottom up and top down. Um, and um, John Poggenhorn comments on this in the context of God interacting with um, creation. So, so he says um, there is much cloudy, unpredictable process throughout the whole physical world. It is a coherent possibility that God interacts with the history of his creation by means of information input into its open physical processes. processes. Um, so that's an intriguing idea in, in, in terms of, um, of John Polkinghorne's ideas about how God might um, interact um, in creation, as in uh, a theist, not uh, as in, um, uh, yeah, as in a theist, not a deist God. Um, so this begs the question, is God in control? And I think that's a, the kind of question that many of us are, are, are thinking about in the middle of a pandemic. Um, and um, there's, oops, uh, lost the slide. And overall, um, 
and um, most people would say um most christians would say yes god is in control but um there's there's pl plenty of um uh, of, of randomness so that we can have free will um if 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 you believe in free will that is um but in if we think about god and a god's eye view of things god might see order where we only see disorder um often we only see the tiny details of what's going on in our lives and if we had a bigger picture um we might see some of that emergent order um and so sometimes um what we see in terms of the mess of the world around us um, is actually due to that limited vision we have. Um, and, um, and so I think um, disorder is, is, is a challenge to us um, in, our, in our lives, um, especially as scientists, we, we have a real desire for ordered answers to explain things in nice, neat, ordered ways. And sometimes um, in life, we just don't have that. Um, and either because we can't see the bigger picture because of where we are in, in, in time or space, um, or, or because um, there simply aren't easy ordered answers. Um, so um, Job is full of, of rhetorical questions like this. Um, the Lord said, says, who is it that obscures my plans with words without knowledge? Um, and Job responds to, to God, surely I spoke of things I did not understand, things too wonderful for me to know. So there's this real message in, in, in Job that, that we can't, we don't know everything, but that's okay. Um, we're not going to know everything, we're only humans. Um, but as scientists, we're trying to understand more. And, and so we've got this, uh, um, this tension um, in, in being um, relatively comfortable with not understanding everything and yet seeking to know more. Um, and the other theological concept when we're talking about disorder in order is the idea that sin is some disorder ruining god's order um and in that in that context um jesus brings um a, um jesus's death brings order to that disorder um so that's a, another interesting concept but as i said earlier i don't see disorder as all bad um so i think this analogy with um disorder and, and sin is is only partial um, so I think as Christians um, who are working in, in, in science, um, and in some senses, there's a challenge of restoring order to us. And I think this is particularly relevant um, in, uh, in medicine um, and in science that has, um, um, has applications to medicine. So, for example, in, in the immune system or in cancer, which are things that I'm interested in um, in, in my work. Um, this is a, an immune cell chasing a bacterium. Um, and I'm fascinated in, in, ha in how cells move um, and the physics of, um, of what's happening there in order for them to, to move and chase um, and eventually um, destroy bacteria. Like it finally gets it there. There it goes. Um, so, um, um, oh yeah, I've forgotten to put this slide in. So this is some work I'm doing at the moment with a, a PhD student of mine, Natasha Cowley, which is relevant to, to breast cancer metastasis. Um, and that's about how, how cells move. So I'd like to finish by um, saying that um, the fact that both order and disorder is important is an example of paradox, which um, is very common in, in the Hebrew worldview. Um, and as Westerners, we, we're not very comfortable with paradoxes. That's not really part of our worldview. Um, but for the Hebrew worldview, um, these contrasts, contrasts and apparent opposites of, of paradoxes um, were something that they, they, they were much more comfortable with um, than, than we often are now. Um, and this, of course, is the Chinese philosophy, yin and yang, seemingly opposite um, forces being in connect, uh, interconnected. And, and in some ways, I think that's, um, a nice way of viewing order and disorder that they're that they're connected and both important. So to conclude, um, my uh, my view is that ordered and purposeful and, and beautiful systems can emerge from microscopic disorder, um, and that this gives um, us wonder at um, ingenious mechanisms. And for Christians, such wonder can lead to worship and to works, as in. Um, doing things to help uh, restore order where order has been broken. Um, so that's everything I wanted to say. And I'm rather hoping that um, some of what I have said has, has triggered some questions. So I will pause there and see what questions have come up. Um, 
uh, I mean, I'm a professor of polymer chemistry, so my ears always prick up when I hear the word polymerization. And I'm absolutely fascinated by the sort of system you're talking about, where um, you have a kind of polymerization um, uh, and you build up networks and structures, and it is all a stochastic process in a sense, a, a random process. And actually, of course, even the sort of polymerization that, that, that my group does, uh, which is step growth polymerization, so we put some energy in, but at the same time, we can't predict which two monomers are going to react, uh, what's going to happen, and yet we can predict the outcome. And that's one area where we can have disorder and yet, in that case, predictability. Um, and it does show up this sort of paradox, which I, which I think you brought out, that, that uh, within the way the world works, which as Christians we'd understand the world that God has made and the way he's designed it, if you like to use that word, um, there is both randomness, disorder, and yet emerging from that order, predictability. Um, I think one of the things that I found um, most... Uh, uh, challenging is this is, is the concept you raised of um, uh, uh, what do we call open theism? <laughs> um, does God know in advance? Um, because to me that opens up all sorts of questions about whether God is temporal, whether God is bound by time, or whether time is a part of what God has made. And so I've always tended to see. God as outside of everything that we perceive as temporal. Um, and I guess the biblical backup to that in thinking about stochastic processes would be something like um, Proverbs 16.33, the lot is cast into the lap, but it's every decision is from God. In other words, the Bible seems to see stochastic processes as being under God's control. And, and therefore, I would perhaps see it him as knowing the end point. But Maybe you could elaborate a little bit on um, how God fits into time and yet can be beyond time. Yeah, thank you. This um, I, I was hoping this would uh, produce some controversy. Um, the the view that you um, were describing there of God being outside of time um, is um, is actually a view that I um, completely subscribed to in, in my younger days. Um, and uh, as often happens when we get older, we, we realise we understand less and less. And <laughs> I'm not sure I agree with myself from my younger days now. Um, but um, the the reason that I I struggle with God with the concept of God being completely outside of time and determining everything um, is that I find that very difficult to reconcile with a loving, a loving God who lets us make decisions and make mistakes. Um, and so this, um, the, the, I, th I mean, I, I, I do think that God is, is all powerful and could have set up the universe however he wanted to so so in a sense um god could be completely outside of time really the question is um is god completely outside of time and and i think um to some extent god does interact with time because god interacts with us his creatures and we are bound by time so there is some sense in which god does interact with time um and that may be part of god's chosen self limitation in order to to have meaningful interactions with with us as human beings but personally i really struggle with reconciling the traditional view of god being outside of space time and how that fits with free will of of, of humans and do i really have free will or has god predetermined what i'm going to decide or what i'm going to do and does that mean god has predetermined the things I'm going to do wrong. And that doesn't make sense to me theologically. So what makes sense to me theologically is that I'm responsible for my um, actions, um, including the actions that I, I do wrong. And, and it's not God forcing me to make those wrong um, choices. Um, so um, th those are some of my thoughts on it. Um, I, I'm, I, I should hasten to add I'm a physicist and not a theologian um so uh, i like uh, many people on this uh, in, in this meeting probably uh, re resort to reading theologians rather than doing theology ourselves but i think as as thinking christians we naturally 
do engage in a certain amount of theology in our in our thinking, just in terms of of trying to understand things. Okay, so uh, would we be able to have free will, assuming we have it, in a universe without some form of disorder hiding the future? I think that picks up some of what you've been saying. Yeah. So, Gavin, I I I I. I I agree with that statement. Well, it's a question, isn't it? But <laughs> so, so I, I think we, if the if the universe was completely deterministically um, d- determined, then how could we have free will? I can't see a space for free will if everything is completely um, uh, um, uh, deterministically caused. Um, and so, in in that sense, um, if the if the future is is open in the sense that it depends on things that are happening now and decisions that are being made now, etc., then I I think disorder is an important part of that. Um, yes, all of that is prefaced with if you believe, if assuming we have free will, because some people say that our free will is an illusion that we uh, that we think we've got free will, but we don't actually. Okay, so then we have a question. Is much of the order in biology then inherent to matter rather than only coded for by, for example, DNA? Um, Yes, as a physicist, I would say that um, a lot of the disorder and order in biology is inherent to all matter. So um, it's hard to think of anything more ordered than a crystal. Um, But there's nothing living about a crystal. Um, but if you discover a, a crystal, uh, even a tiny little crystal in a, a speck in a, in a piece of rock on the seashore or something, it, it's beautiful and it's ordered. Um, and it's hard to imagine something that's more ordered than that. So um, biology has order and disorder in it. And a lot of that is inherent to the materials that it's made of. Um, the DNA is crucially important to organizing life and to reproducing life um but i do think in biology there's there's an interplay between the physical properties of matter and the biochemical properties of the of the molecules involved i think both are crucially important although the the, the order of a crystal is an interesting one because of course you can get um entropically driven crystallization and uh, so that, that 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 raises some interesting questions. That actually the crystal can be, in entropy terms, more disordered than um, the non-crystal. But yes, <laughs> we'll move on from that for now. Um, we have a perhaps a more more down-to-earth question. Do you have any suggestions or examples of aspects prevalent in today's churches which we feel are disorder, but should maybe stand back and accept that God might have a bigger view? Okay, that's a that's a very um, interesting point. That's a very good point at the moment, I think, because um, I'll, I'll I'll give a an example from Sheffield, um, just the other side of the of the Pennines from you. Um, so early on in the in the pandemic, um, many people were were struggling with not being able to go to church, um, and. Um, and many people were viewing that, you know, in in a terms of, in, in in some senses of, of disorder. This virus that um, is is a form of disorder and disrupting the health and everything and disrupting our lives and and even disrupting our church services. Um, but I listened to a, a fantastic sermon from our Bishop of Sheffield on on the radio, um, and um, and this was um, I'm trying to remember exactly when, but maybe a month or two into into um, the the pandemic. And he was commenting on the vast numbers of people who were going to Zoom services who wouldn't normally go to church at all. Um, and that actually maybe this was a, a kind of wake up call for us about how we do church and um, thinking about modern ways of, of communicating um, with communities around us. Um, and so I think that's an example of something whereby um, we were all focused on on the disorder aspect and the, oh no, this is terrible, what's happening? But actually, um, Maybe the bigger picture that we might only be able to look at, look back at in years to come, of uh, of many very positive things um, that are coming out of this very difficult year that we're going through. So I think that's an example of something relevant to today's church, 
that what we're seeing as disorder that we're having to have services on Zoom might actually, um, in a bigger picture, be um, forcing us to um, new creative ways of doing church and ways of reaching out to um, our friends and neighbours around us who, who wouldn't normally go to a traditional church service but might benefit hugely from online um, activities. Uh, I think that's a really helpful example. Another question here, is God himself subject to the second law? We know from Romans 8 that his creation was subjected to decay. Okay, well, um, as a physicist, I study God's creation and I agree with um, what you say about the second law and, and, and Romans 8, that the creation is subject to de decay. Um, God is not creation um, in terms of the Christian worldview of, of God. So God is different from creation. I would therefore be tempted to say that, that God is not subject to the second law of thermodynamics. God uh, created the second law of thermodynamics, um, which is, uh, I mean, what is the second law of thermodynamics? It's a way that we uh, uh, can understand what's happening um, in creation. So I'd be tempted to say, I don't think God is subject to the second law. Okay, and uh, another question here, could you expand a bit the information input in the John Polkinghorne quotation? Yeah, so um, I'm not John Polkinghorne, but I've discussed with him a little bit on this point, and so I will try to um, say what I think he means. Um, so um, it's relevant to the question of, of how does God communicate with us? How does God interact? With us how and if if God is really interacting with us and communicating with us then that means God is in some way giving information into um, the creation um, in a time uh, in a time sequence manner um, in time um, so as in now rather than at the Big Bang um, and Polkinghorne's suggestion is that um, God could do this um, in inputting information, for example, at the level of a quantum mechanical event, um, and um, is it is it A or B? Um, and and we can only calculate the probabilities, but could God be tweaking it to um, to, to use that to input information into the world? Now that's uh, fraught with all kinds of controversial um, discussion points on that, but um, that is my understanding of what John Polkinghorne suggests here. And one further question, uh, referring to back, that God knows the outcome of the dice. Doesn't this suggest his knowledge is more than knowing probabilities? Um, so if, um, if God does know the outcome of the dice, um, then that would suggest he knows more than just the probability. Um, I would question, does God know the outcome of the dice? And what kind of dice are we talking about? Um, is this the kind of dice where if we knew, ex if we knew uh, enough about the air friction and the exact angle at which it was dropped and um, all the rotational um, dynamics of the, of, the di of the dice falling, we would be able to actually deterministically calculate which way the dice was going to fall. If that's the case, then I would say, yeah, God can do that calculation, even if we can't. But if it's the kind of indeterminate result, for example, of a quantum mechanical um, um, experiment, then that's where maybe God doesn't know more than the probability. Or maybe, as Polkinghorne suggests, maybe God tweaks it <laughs> at that point, and that's a way in which he interacts with, um, with our creation. Um, so it, it, it's it's a big question. Does God know more than the probability? Um, God certainly knows more than we do, um, but we don't know very much. <laughs> um, the question is, um, does does yeah? I think it's a it, it, it's a that's the question I'm posing, but I'm not I'm not going to claim to to give a definitive answer. Okay. 